What I want to do is talk about two things, essentially. One is what the uprising can tell us about uh, human societies in general. I know this is a big topic. Uh, but uh, I think there are some lessons here. Um, and then also explore some of the, the legacies. So uh, the, not only the events of the uprising itself, but how, uh, what role it's played in Slovak society um, in the 75 years after. I think that the uprising is a great example of um, a situation of moral choice. Um, and this is a really common theme in the history of World War II more generally. Um, a situation of unparalleled destruction, a situation of massive political disruption, uh, where people are forced to make complex decisions at a very fast clip under immense pressure and danger. Um, there have been a lot of stories here about uh, the uprising as a reflection of a striving for human dignity and for self-government, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to lessen um, the, the the power of those stories and take away from them. But I'd ask that we just shift our perspective to examine um, some of the broader considerations that folks may have been weigh weighing during this period. So um, the first story I want to share is from this gentleman uh, Gideon Frieder. Uh, who um, is a, a Holocaust survivor and volunteer at the museum where I work, and he's also a friend and colleague. Uh, he uh, is the, the son of Abraham Frieder, who was a very prominent rabbi in um, Slovak society during the war um, and, and the years prior. And because he was so influential uh, and and well connected, he uh, was able to uh, receive an exemption from deportation, and he remained in Slovakia, um, working on, on various efforts to save the, the Slovak Jewish population throughout that period. This really changed when the uprising broke out. Um, as German forces occupied the country, uh, the situation for Slovak Jews who had remained in hiding up until this point got drastically worse. Uh, simply because the Germans were now occupying uh, the country. Uh, it's worth remembering that there weren't that many of them left because most of them had been uh, deported in 1942, about, about 50,000. So there were about 10 to 20,000 uh, Jews, give or take, less, left in Slovakia at this time. Well, Gideon uh, suddenly finds himself alone after his mother and sister are killed in a bombing raid. Uh, his father disappears. Um, somewhere uh, in, in Bratislava, and suddenly Gideon is by himself um, in the mountains of central Slovakia and survives miraculously by the aid of a partisan who places him in the company or the home of a, a Slovak um, couple in the village of Huli, um, Polina and Jozef Lichacek. Um, and this is an amazing situation uh, for a number of reasons. Um, Firstly, the, uh, the Slihavchuk family uh, took Gideon without any pre prior knowledge. We've heard similar stories of the way partisans were protected um, by, by total strangers. Um, and this is the kind of compassion and warmth that Gideon describes when he recalls his experience in Syrian spirit. Um, the, the story is of a warm surrogate home opened by Paulina and Uncle Paulina, excuse me, Uncle Josef and Aunt Paulina. Um, and this couple really risked their lives by hiding him, um, much like others, others we've heard about. Um, Gideon remarked of them, I've never felt anything but love, willingness, and support from these people. Um, years later, he returned to, um, to Bully and met the daughter of, uh, of these Tlichakchik uh, parents, and they, this woman told him that they had never regarded him as anything but their own son. Um, these risks, which we've heard about, that people um, across this uprising territory took during this period were, were indeed extreme. Um, as we've heard about uh, the efforts to punish those who were hiding Jews, who were hiding uh, partisans, uh, were, ex were, were absolutely deadly. Um, and uh, that makes us really have to consider the heroism and, and recognize the heroism of those like this Tlikashi family. On the other hand, we have what's been discussed. Uh, you and I touched on uh, the town of Niemetska, where uh, I think he said 900 Jews 
uh, politic, so-called political enemies and Slovak partisans were uh, executed following the uprising. This is another example, um, of course not an isolated incident. Um, and this, this type of terror was of course common as we've learned today. Um, but what I want to point out about it is that, that it was a, a Slovak who was re uh, indeed responsible for this, uh, or in part responsible for the, the massacres in Kalinicka and in Niemenska. Uh, Ladislav Mishniansky uh, was a, a career officer in the Slovak army, and he was in fact a commander during the Slovak national uprising. After he was captured <clears throat> in November of 1944, he was given the choice to go to Mauthausen or to Flossenburg like his colleagues, or to join one of these units that were uh, seeking to uh, murder Slovak Jews and other so-called enemies alongside the Germans. So we have these two stories. Now, what, what do we do with this information? Um, what are the considerations that uh, individuals uh, take with them when they're faced with this kind of danger? Because both the Strihacek uh, uh, couple and Ladislav Wisniewski face a similar threat of death. Um, and I really want to point out that this incident, this event, this massive revolutionary upheaval uh, that seized Slovakia in, in 1944, has to put, uh, has to highlight the types of choices that they, that it what those types of situations require of people. Um, Nishnyansky, by the way, was, uh, he never really had to pay the price for his actions. He was acquitted in, in 2009 uh, for lack of evidence. Um, there is certainly plenty of evidence. Um, moving on to a broader frame, so beyond these two individual stories. Why did people, well let me, let me start with a number. The population of wartime Slovakia is roughly two million. In the days before the uprising, we have about 10,000 people working within the resistance, uh, working to oppose, actively oppose the Slovak uh, regime under Josef Tisa. Two million people, 10,000 uh, brave resistors. Without denigrating the, the memory of those who, who were already very committed to the resistance, I think we have to look at those numbers and scratch our heads a little bit. But I, there's very good reasons for this low participation in the resistance. In, this is, of course, before the summer of 1944. I'm talking about for the duration of the war, or the earlier part of the war. We have to look at the policies of the Slovak uh, People's Party, the policies of the Tiso administration to, to understand why people uh, were unwilling to oppose them. Unlike in Nazi Germany, uh, you were unlikely to face the threat of death uh, in Slovakia if you opposed the Tiso regime. Uh, there were various measures taken, especially in the early days, for opposing um, uh, this, the, the policies and, and, and administration of the regime, but it's not like in Nazi Germany where you will be outright executed if you, you know, fail to pledge allegiance to the Fuhrer. The Slovak People's Party worked to win supporters with populist promises. It appealed to particularly the Slovak peasantry with an argument that elites in Prague uh, and, and elsewhere abroad wanted to deprive them of prosperity, of religious freedom, and at the same time they demonized uh, Slovak Jews in such a way to gain favor among the public. They targeted this uh, tendency that existed within the Slovak population to blame uh, the, the Jewish minority in Slovakia for uh, social and uh, economic problems that they saw happening around them. The state's propaganda slogan of a dream of smiling Slovakia implied a guarantee and increased expectation of a better living and profit at the expense of, guess who? Slovakia's Jews. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about the policies of Aryanization, um, in which Jewish businesses, Jewish assets, uh, land um, were transferred 
uh, into government hands and into private hands uh, with the express intent of gaining political legitimacy amongst the population. This political strategy of stoking fear, nationalist fervor, and the redistribution of wealth was successful. Uh, a 1940 report from one Slovak party office celebrated the, 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 these successes, observing that here and there we note again a certain uneasiness. Slovaks understand neither the content nor the reach of the new regime, and its policies seem foreign to them. But soon enough, when social and anti-Jewish measure, measures follow, radicalism begins to appeal to the people, insofar as it leads to the breakup of Jewish economic power and economic gain. We have to take this with a grain of salt. It was coming from a party office. Uh, but the, the point stands. One other thing that led to the uh, relative lack of resistance or acquiescence to the rule of Tiso and his party was something that Uri focused on earlier today, and that's in 1939 to 1943, everybody across the entire continent, and indeed the world, believes that Nazi Germany is going to win the war and uh, will be ruling over the continent for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Um, one can really identify with why you might not want to, um, to, to raise your hand in opposition to what seems like an indomitable and uh, invincible uh, um, empire that stretches across half the world, um, or at least half of their world. The rapid advances of, of the German army of, across much of Europe um, also made it seem pointless to oppose them. Um, one Slovak historian has described this moment, the intersection of these two particular developments, this relationship of passing on the wealth of persecuted minority and this uh, general sense that resistance was futile as a demon of consent. And this is why in 1942, the official party ranks of the Slovak People's Party had reached almost half a million. Uh, now, we don't know how many of those people, of course, were ardent supporters of the, of the ideology that they were supposedly subscribing to, but we do know that they, at least on paper, uh, identified with this regime. So, why the change? And this is something that my colleague from uh, the Museum of the Slovak National Uprising already pointed out. What happened in this time from 1943 to 1944? Well, when American bombers start destroying your capital city, it might change your impression of who is going to win the war. Um, these raids launched, as we learned in that really excellent film, um, launched from Italy in 1943, had enabled uh, the Allied forces to reach Slovakia, and this brought the war home. Keep in mind that before this point, Slovakia had seen almost no real combat on its own soil. This was a, a veritable paradise compared to the neighbors. If you look at Poland, if you look at, uh, well, Hungary is an exception, but if you look at Ukraine, if you look further east to the Soviet Union, the, the further reaches of the Soviet Union, Slovakia was an island of peace, prosperity, and stability. These air raids, as you saw on the maps that were in the film, spread across the country. So uh, it wasn't just Bratislava, but even Banska Bystrica. To the east, as we heard already, there was an even more ominous development. The Red Army suddenly appears at the approaches to the Carpathian Mountains in, in early 1944. Um, news of the Russian front, wrote one Slovak party official in March 1944, now dominates debate and public opinion. Word of these advances mingled with anticipation, rumor, and provocation spread everywhere, and everyone worried that war would soon swallow the country. Well, the partisans, as we've already heard, added to this atmosphere of panic, added to this context of massive disruptions, relatively sudden. Before this, uh, this uh, sorry, the attack uh, on Bratislava in June of, of 1944, there, there hadn't 
been a, really a shot fired, more or less. We've heard about the, the activity of the partisans, particularly in central and eastern Slovakia, and the ways that they generally um, caused a lot of a lot of havoc. Um, and this wasn't always welcomed by the civilian population, I should know. Uh, partisans have a nasty habit of needing to eat. And when they don't get food from uh, willing uh, 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 collaborators, uh, they will take it. Um, so this wasn't in all cases a welcome development. So as we know, the situation becomes intolerable, and Tiso consents to have the, uh, the German army occupy uh, Slovakia, and the uprising begins. And as we've heard from other colleagues, it, it sparks a massive revolutionary upheaval. I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, overstating it to say that this development was revolutionary. Um, in fact, I believe that as more and more uh, discussion of the uprising comes to a wider, uh, a wider sphere of study, we will, continue, we will start to understand it as a Slovak revolution. Um, what I want to underscore, as I, as I said when I began, is that there were actual moral assessments, excuse me, there were actual practical considerations that people had to weigh that make moral assessments of their behavior difficult. And this means that we should very carefully think about what we mean when we discuss heroism and what we mean when we discuss uh, evil. Um, that there were pressures weighing on people that we might not immediately recognize. Um, we can't forget that rational self-interest is a powerful motivator of human behavior. Um, it's, it seems to me that there is an innate impulse in human beings that uh, allows a pursuit of personal gain to be distorted into hatred um, and into persecution of so-called enemies. And we saw this before the uprising, we saw it after the uprising. And we continue to see it uh, today in Slovakia and of course across the world. Um, if you could advance. So now on to something a little bit different. So I said I would like to talk about human behavior in general, but now I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the legacies um, and the way that the, the uprising has this tremendously powerful, um, emotionally enveloping event has come to be stitched into the fabric of Slovak politics and Slovak society in general. Well, we know, at least a little bit, uh, that this has always uh, been a source of discussion and debate. Since 1944, people have been talking about this event in Slovakia and um, the enduring importance of this event in, in European history is, is quite uh, well established. Um, as others have noted, the effect, at least uh, on a political level, of the Slovak National Uprising was to restore a partial respectability to Slovak nationalism and Slovak national identity. Uh, before 1944, uh, to emerge onto the world stage following the defeat of Nazi Germany without the uprising uh, wouldn't have been a possibility. Um, my research on these legacies has uh, tried to explore how this event in its commemoration, as you see here, uh, the first annual uh, one on August 29th, 1945, um, have been used by political actors to pursue uh, certain agendas. Um, now, we heard before that the primary forces, political forces remaining in Slovakia in 1945 were the Communist Party and the Democratic Party. Uh, the other pre-war parties had, had been totally wiped out. Of course, you couldn't be a member of the Slovak People's Party in 1945. And as, as we can see here in the photo at, um, at your right, um, this was a, a, a broad coalition. We have um, third from uh, the left uh, is Gustav Husak, one of uh, the most prominent uh, Slovak politicians in history and also uh, a chief uh, organizer in the Slovak National Council and an organizer of the uprising also. Uh, and of course, to the right, you probably recognize about Benish. Um, standing on the same stage, celebrating the, the first anniversary of the uprising and 
Um, according to one observer at that event, uh, excuse me, they were gathered to celebrate, quote, those acts by which we protected and laid a firm basis for the integri integrity and indivisibility of the Czechoslovak Republic. Um, so this was a, a public ritual that was about reconstituting the entire society uh, as a Czech, recognizing its Czechoslovak character. Um, and as Johnny, I appreciated that you pointed out in, in your last remarks that there was uh, certainly an emphasis on Slovakia's uh, sovereignty within that body. So we're not simply talking about the pre-war pre -war version of uh, Czechoslovakism, we're talking about Czechoslovak brotherhood with space for, um, for, for a distinct Slovak nation, and that is very, very important. Well, I'm sure it won't surprise you that the communists and democrats didn't get along uh, very soon after this. And uh, as Juraj alluded to in his, uh, in his remarks, this failure of the, of the communists to actually win power in Slovakia via the ballot box left them with dirty tricks. Um, and one of the dirty tricks, interestingly, they found to be quite effective, was to accuse uh, Slovak democratic leaders who had been very active in this rebellion, in this revolution, of being reactionary, of being traitors to the uprising. And in many case even, uh, cases even suggesting that they had somehow attempted to sabotage the uprising uh, during, uh, you know, during its, its course. This was an attempt to limit the influence of Democrats in Czechoslovak and Slovak society. Well, it worked. This wasn't the only tool, it was one, but through events like the, these anniversaries, which happen obviously every year, uh, speakers like Husak and others were able to use the events to highlight a new meaning for the uprising, to articulate a different position about who had been uh, really uh, to thank for the, the glorious events and, and revolutionary change that, that, that had unfolded. So less than three years after the war, uh, following the communist coup uh, in 1948, uh, authorities were already revealing anti-state plots uh, that were, uh, of course, uh, supposedly being, uh, being launched by Democrats and members of, of the, the uh, uprising underground. And of course, these folks were either arrested, charged with treason and imprisoned, or they fled the country on their own will while they still could. Um, and Johnny has told me uh, really interesting stories about uh, his experiences uh, meeting Josef Lettrich, who was one of the uh, first, uh, one, was one of the most important organizers of the uprising, who, who actually managed to escape um, for these exact reasons. Well, after this uh, seizure of power in 1948, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia also finds the uprising a very useful tool to promote its economic agenda. This is a uh, very classic uh, uh, Soviet-era propaganda in Slovakia. shows industrialization of, of the kind that you think of when you think of you know, Stalin's rule in the satellite countries and uh, in the Soviet Union in general. We're building huge plants. We're building uh, new roads. We are re uh, rejuvenating the Slovak economy in the spirit of the Slovak National Uprising. So now the Slovak National Uprising is used to promote an agenda that has nothing actually to do. I mean, it has to do with the dreams of a prosperous and happy society, uh, but it com becomes completely propagandized for a particular uh, aim, which in that case was uh, assuring a pro-Soviet uh, foreign policy stance uh, in, uh, in, in this Cold War, early Cold War period, and uh, doing, you know, taking, the, taking on this massive industrialization campaign that, that characterized uh, Czechoslovakia during that period. Um, there were also, of course, massive military parades put on by the authorities to impress the populace with the might and invincibility of the regime, and more importantly, to discourage them from protesting against that regime. Well, this particular course, which uh, others have also mentioned, changed uh, somewhat dramatically in the mid-1960s with uh, what is sometimes referred to as the Slovak Spring, 
you probably heard of the Czech, uh, you know, the, the Prague Spring. The Slovak Spring, uh, actually, like uh, many things, it seems like, where the Slovaks were a little bit ahead of their time, the, uh, the Czechs uh, catch up. Um, it began with historians like Josef Jablonicki, um, who received the prize posthumously, uh, writing the real history of the uprising. And the, the, uh, the, the chair of the Czechoslovak Communist Party at that time, uh, Alexander Dubček, I'm sure you're all, many of you are familiar with, uh, was responsive to this kind of change in the intellectual culture surrounding the uprising, surrounding the history of the war, surrounding uh, the ways that uh, Slovak, uh, Slovakia had been treated um, in this new post-war arrangement. And um, this, this new view of the uprising as being not just about a, a, a Soviet and partisan-based effort um, to, to liberate Slovakia from, from, uh, from tyranny, uh, began to be challenged. Um, so this was part, the uprising was a part of a, the broader liberalization campaign that, uh, that was led by Dutch in the late, late 1960s. And a very interesting accident of history is that in August of 1968, when the uh, Soviet Red Army occupies uh, Czechoslovakia uh, on August 22nd, I believe, uh, well, guess what they're preparing to do? They're preparing to have an uprising celebration in Martin, uh, in Batskovistrica, of course, in Bratislava. So imagine the irony of the uh, celebration of defending against an, an invader who has come to crush your freedom at the same moment that you are being occupied by an invader who has come to crush your freedom. Uh, this was not lost on, actually, the reformist Czechoslovak Commons Party. They, this was a reformist party. They didn't want to have uh, Leonid Brezhnev and the, uh, the Soviet uh, Central Committee directing everything they did in Slovakia or Czechoslovakia. They wanted to proceed on their own course of political development. Well, that was, of course, deemed intolerable, which is why we got this occupation. And Dubček was removed from power in 1969. Dubček's father, by the way, was a partisan uh, who, uh, who had fought in the uprising, uh, interestingly enough. Um, well, who do we get in, uh, as Dubček is pushed away in 1969, is the gentleman I mentioned before. Uh, if you can, yes, yes. Uh, Gustav Husak, who most of you are probably familiar with. Um, Husak was viewed as a very palatable character to take over this responsibility precisely because of his role in the Slovak National Uprising, precisely because he represented an initial uh, impulse of the uprising to gain more national rights for Slovaks. Uh, he had actually insisted on this in the post-war period, saying this is what the uprising uh, had meant to us, and he was jailed. So he was actually a former political prisoner. Uh, well, he was called in. The uh, previous iteration of the uprising was reinstalled as the, as the, um, as the lingua franca, as the, the rule of the day, with the exception that Slovakia was, Czechoslovakia was now federated. So Slovakia, nominally at least, uh, re, uh, regained its uh, status as an independent body within, within Czechoslovakia. And this is something that Husak was perfectly equipped to do, uh, as he had argued for that all along. Well, of course, uh, from Husak's appointment to the end of, of uh, the, the Soviet um, regime in Czechoslovakia. Um, it's about, let's see, over 20 years. Um, for that 20 years, there was relatively strict control about what could be said about the Slovak National Uprising. And well, this changed after the, the uh, Velvet Revolution. And the anniversary celebrations for the uprising became uh, connected with the ambitions of a post-Soviet Slovak Republic, eventually. Not quite a republic yet, but a few years later. Um, and it was this international character, this engagement with Europe, this openness um, that had been demonstrated uh, at, as you know, a collaborative venture in the uprising that became really connected with every single uh, uprising celebration, uh, anniversary celebration. It was again, 
a sign of uh, Slovakia's commitment to human dignity and freedom um, in a democratic lens. Um, so more recently, as uh, you may be aware, the legacy of the uprising has become more divisive. Um, the Slovak far right, uh, People's Party, our Slovakia, uh, the chief representative of, of which you see on the right, Maria Kotleba, who uh, was, uh, whose party won over 8% of the vote in Slovakia's parliamentary election in 2016, uh, and also became the regional governor of Banska Bistrica, um, demonstrates an infatuation with Tiso, uh, an embrace of the paramilitary uniforms worn by, of the kind worn by the Hlinka Gar, uh, and emphasizes xenophobic anti-European uh, policies. Um, well, I think we can understand this, this fascination, this, uh, this adherence to uh, a, a, an aggrandized memory of the Slovak state as a, a, another a, a opposite pole to the celebration and remembrance of the Slovak national uprising. These are two big, important historical phenomena in Slovak history that have now become opposed. Slovak state, Slovak national uprising, and they've been in conversation for uh, 75 years, really. Um, unfortunately, the popular nostalgia for this, the Tiso um, cult and, and for the Slovak state has only increased uh, in the 21st century, um, and though Kotleba's People's Party, our Slovakia, um, lost uh, support in the elections last year, uh, I was just speaking to you and I before, and there is great fear in Slovakia now that they will be gaining in the upcoming elections in February. So it seems for Slovakia and probably for Europe more generally, we're not going to see the end of right-wing nationalism and populism um, anytime soon. Um, but I just want to conclude by saying, I think for me, as someone who, who, who has worked a lot on this material, the, the Slovak National Uprising is just as worth celebrating for its actual accomplishments, um, military and otherwise, in 1944, as it is for its power as a symbol in a democratic society. Sy the symbolism of the uprising, I would say, is now bigger than the uprising itself. And uh, Yuri also informed me that earlier about some of the preparations that are in place for what's happening uh, in a few days in Slovakia, and it's remarkable. I mean, there have been millions and millions and millions of euros invested in this, uh, in this big, big um, uh, recognition of, of that 75th anniversary. Um, I also think these kinds of powerful symbolic events, which provoke a lot of intense emotion and a lot of um, Incredible associations, uh, like we heard from Demeter earlier, these memories have a very strong imprint on folks, and not just those who lived them, those who grew up uh, in the shadow of them. Uh, they have emotional power. They have the power to motivate us. They have the power to communicate and advance certain messages in society. And I think that this is, this is the most important aspect of the legacy, is that something that happened in 1944 has had the power to embody so many other ideals. Um, I like to say that events like the uprising with this revolutionary component that assert democracy, such as the French Revolution or uh, the events of 1989 across the former Soviet bloc, remind us of what is good and what is possible. Um, and in, I think what we can agree is a moment of moral, and moral danger and political disorder for much of the world uh, we would do well to turn again and again to the consideration of that memory. So that's how I'd like to conclude. Thank you.